Well, when Phil Rodrup received a letter from a desperate mom whose son had strayed far from his faith, he couldn't get her words out of his mind. Her plea sent him on a quest to understand so-called prodigals, basically those who've turned away from the faith of their upbringing, and to find ways to help the families left behind. Phil, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Cheryl. I'm honored to be here with you. You know, I didn't tell you this before the interview, but I actually am a prodigal. Ah. And I am only here today, and I know God has told me because of the prayers of my parents. Mm -hmm. So I tell people all the time, there's hope for prodigals. You know, where you are today isn't necessarily where you're going to end up. Right. And that's the hope I know that you're giving. It is the hope. It's what I want to give to parents. It's what I want to give to grandparents. I want to give to every family member who has someone they love who've walked away. Yeah, well, you know, you sat down with a focus group of 30 prodigals mm -hmm. and really dived into their story, like current prodigals, not people who were there like me, but people who are currently there and really dived into why they are where they are at. What was the cause? What did you find out of those conversations? Well, you know, I went to the scriptures and I studied the scriptures, but I found myself at a little bit of an impasse. And so I went and I invited 30 prodigals, some who are good moral kids who just weren't interested in spiritual things, to people who had every kind of addiction you can imagine, to one who was even incarcerated. And I said, I'm not even going to comment when I interview you. I just want you to be honest. And I discovered that almost all prodigals think the same way. Wow. And you unpacked a lot of this in your book. You know, I have to say, I was underlining like every single word <laughs> of your book. And I was thinking to myself, that's not really helpful because you're supposed to be underlining the highlights. Right. You know, we don't have time to unpack the whole book, mm -hmm. but it's so practical and so helpful, you know, and this is based on the story of the prodigal son in the mm -hmm. Bible. You mm -hmm. don't actually call it that. You call it something different. I like to call it the story of the wonderful father, because when Jesus told that story in the uh, gospel of Luke chapter 15, which by the way, is the only place it's found in the Bible. Many people think that story is found in other places but it isn't. Mm. The focus is on what the father did right rather than the waywardness uh, of the son. So I like to call it the story of the wonderful father rather than the story of the prodigal son. Because that father was so loving. And I, one of the things I love about what you pointed out is that um, the father never went after the son. You know, like he, he waited until the son was broken. And when the son was broken, he came back. So just maybe give us, um, tell us that story for people who are watching who maybe aren't familiar with it, just briefly. It's a, it's a story Jesus told to teach really about his love and how he really goes after us. A man had two sons, Jesus said. The younger son said, give me my inheritance. Give me everything that's mine and I want to leave. And he went to live in a, a, what was called a four country, which literally meant he left his Jewish culture. He left the country. He left his family. He abandoned everything. And for a few days, man, it was great. Probably even for a few years. Yeah. He was partying. He had money. And then he became desperate and he was hungry. And he was so desperate, Jesus said, he ended up feeding pigs. And for a Jewish father, for a Jewish boy, that was the total abandonment of everything he had been taught as a child. Mm -hmm. But while he was in the pig pen, Jesus said he came to himself and he realized that the servants my father have are living better than I'm living. And so he said, I will arise and go to my father. And the neat part about that story was he didn't ask the question, can I go home? Because the father had removed all the barriers. But instead he said, I'm not sure whether I'll be a servant or whether I be a son. And when he came home to his father, his father saw him, ran and kissed him and said, kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party. It's going to be great. My son is home. And I think that is what I long for every parent, every grandparent mm -hmm. who has a child, especially who's walked away, that they get to have the time when they come home many times, literally to the family, but certainly spiritually. Yeah, that's such a wonderful story. And mm -hmm. you know, that, that one point where he is in the pig pen and he mm -hmm. says, wait a minute, like the, the servants in my father's house are doing better than me. I have to go home. That broken moment, you say that that hitting bottom, that kind of broken moment is key to prodigals coming home. Tell me about that. Well, it is key because sometimes as parents, we rush in to rescue our prodigals. Mm -hmm. We rush in to fix our prodigals and we never let them face the consequences of what they did wrong. And one of the things when I wrote the book, Reaching Your Prodigal, that I discovered, in fact, I actually share six principles, six practical things parents can do. And one of those principles is let your prodigals face the consequences of their decisions. It's tough love. We sometimes call it tough love, but it's allowing them to experience the pain of the choices they've made. It hurts, it hurts our hearts, but sometimes that's the only thing that brings brokenness into their life. And until they're broken, they're not really going to return spiritually or literally to their family. Remember, the father could have sent a servant with soup and a sandwich. He could have sent, a, he could have sent money, would have gotten him out of the pig pen, 
but it would not have gotten him home. Yeah, that's a really smart father. And I've mm -hmm. never thought about that, that you actually don't see, and it doesn't make a point of it in the story, but you really don't see him doing anything until right. the day that he decides to come home. Mm -hmm. And then you say, this is the next key, because when he decides to come home, okay, in our flesh, sometimes in our humanness, we might say right. like, I told you that was a bad decision. Mm -hmm. What were you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, we could kind of like lord it over them <laughs> or kind of punish them a little bit for hurting us or being irresponsible, mm -hmm. but he doesn't do that. No, because one of the principles I share is guard your words. Guard your words when they're away. Don't be critical of other Christians or church leaders. Try to affirm people of faith uh, because sometimes, you know, the devil takes the things that we say and he magnifies them in the ears of our prodigals. And the very person that God may be using to get the attention of your prodigal is the very person you're criticizing. But then when they do come home, still guard your words. Because sometimes when prodigals come home, if we aren't careful, we send them back to the pig pen by telling them, don't you owe us some explanations? Don't you owe some people apologies? Where have you been? And I even counsel uh, parents now and tell them, sometimes you may not want to know the answer to those questions. <laughs> Instead of focusing on their being away, focus on their being home and rejoice. And don't harp on it forever either, right? right? You know, exactly. you, when you were, you did this, and you, <laughs> right? Which we can kind of tend to do because mm -hmm. we, we were right all along and we weren't recognized as being right. But we don't have to be validated by our kids. The fact they've come home validates us enough. And you know, the example I think for all of us as Christians is our heavenly father. Uh, you know, when we ask the Lord to forgive us our sins, he, he forgets their sins. He forgives us and the scripture uses several word pictures. You know, they're thrown into the depths of the sea or he, he, he literally puts them where he remembers them no more. So if our heavenly father doesn't bring up our past, we shouldn't bring up the past of our prodigal. That's right, and we always use that story as an example of how gracious God is to mm -hmm. us, how we don't get what we deserve, and how we are a son and a daughter despite what we've mm -hmm. done, and yet, you know, we don't always extend that grace to the people that are closest to us, that we love the most. I think that's so encouraging, and I, you know, I wanna ask you too, because some people have been waiting a long time. Mm -hmm. Some people have been praying a long time. What if that prodigal never comes home? Is, mm. is there a way for us to survive? And I, you know, I don't want to kill hope here because right. we are all about hope and right. your, your book is full of stories mm -hmm. where prodigals have come home, but will they always come home? Well, I think, you know, you can't say they always will because I think there are cases and I know cases where they never did. But I do believe if parents do the right things, I think at least they set an environment as the father did in that story Jesus told that they can come home. Here's the encouraging thing for parents and for grandparents. I believe every prodigal does come to themselves. There comes a point when they really evaluate their life, they evaluate where they are, and we wanna make sure we've done everything so there's no barriers, there's nothing there, so that when they come to themselves, they know they can come home. Remember in the story of the prodigal son, there's a little phrase we miss, it, referencing the time when he had gone away, he had spent everything he had. And the Bible says, quoting Jesus, and a famine arose in the land. Now, obviously when he left, things were good. But now a famine has arose. That probably took seven to 10 years. So that prodigal son, even in the story Jesus told, was probably gone for seven, 10, maybe 20 years. But we never lose hope as long as they're alive because many prodigals in 60, 70, 80 years of age come back to the Lord. Yeah, you talk about that, you know, that, that not giving up in prayer and that, that the result of your prayers may be seen and you give examples after you're gone even right. like in the Bible where it talks about people who are faithful to God and believed mm -hmm. him for promises that they didn't see in their lifetime. You know, that that's a possibility as well. God never stops working. Very true. And one of the things I have discovered, sometimes it is the death of a parent or a grandparent is the very thing God uses to get the attention of the prodigal. Mm. In fact, when I did the research of prodigals who have come back to the Lord and been restored uh, to their families, one of the most common characteristics I found was the death of a parent or grandparent. So I wanna give hope to parents and grandparents. You may be in heaven when your prodigal comes home, but I think the next best thing to seeing it happen here would be hearing about it over there. Hmm, God coming up to you and saying, hey, I got some news for you. That's right. They've come home. I love that. Well, you know, and you mentioned this earlier about not criticizing the people that God brings in their mm -hmm. life and that, you know, studies show that for most people, we don't listen to our 
parents as much mm -hmm. as we do to our peers. And I've seen that, you know, like mm -hmm. you can be telling someone in your life something that you love a million times, your husband even, or your wife, and then some other person comes along and says it and they listen. <laughs> and and this, is, this is really key, right? Because even if you're a Baptist and mm -hmm. it's say someone from the Anglican church that is mm -hmm. impacting your prodigal, you could be criticizing them saying, hey, that's not our denomination. But you're saying, wait a minute, this isn't one of those times to guard your tongue. Tell me about that. No. Well, I have a friend who had a son who was a prodigal and had, had really made some very poor choices, it was involved in destructive behavior. And he would call me and he would say to me, pray for my son, would you pray for him? And we prayed together. And then one day he called me and he was crying and he said, oh, it's my son again. And I thought, what has he done now? Is he in jail again? Has he, has he taken an overdose? And he said, no, he's gotten right with God. And I said, that's wonderful. He said, it's terrible because he's been going to an Assembly of God church and he got right with God, a Pentecostal church. And, and I said, man, don't, don't be critical of that, rejoice. And I said, you know, when the father embraced his son coming home, he, he could have criticized him. He could have said, well, you know, I, I don't think that farmer should have been the one that let you feed pigs. And he could have blamed everyone else and criticized him. But instead he rejoiced. And I said to my friend, this is not a time to try to get real particular about some denominational differences. This is the time to rejoice. Maybe, maybe, and I'm not always uh, true that it happens, but maybe in the future, there's a time when you can have that conversation. But remember, God can use other people in the body of Christ to minister to your child. They may not look like you or act like you or go to your church or the way you do worship, but they're people who have heart for God and you rejoice and affirm those people rather than criticize those people. Well, there's so much great content here. We're running out of time, but I just mm -hmm. want, can you leave the viewers with one thing that they can mm -hmm. do today before they order your book, uh, Reaching Your Prodigal, mm -hmm. that they can do right now to start changing things with their prodigal? The first thing they can do, and the most important thing I emphasize in the book, and I walk them through how to do this, is get over the guilt. Stop feeling guilty. People feel like, man, it's my fault, so they feel guilty. So the question, I, and people say, well, what did, what did I do wrong? Oh, yeah. It's a very simple question. You probably did nothing wrong. I did the research and found it's not always bad parenting. A child has a choice, they choose to walk away. And if you say, oh, but wait, I know if I do it right, my kids turn out right. Then my question for you is, what did God do wrong with Adam and Eve? Or what did Jesus do wrong with Judas? What did God do wrong with the children of Israel? You can do everything right as a parent mm. and still have a child who walks away. And today my hope for parents is begin by letting that truth sink into your heart and it will set you free because now you're in a position of strength rather than a position of weakness and you cannot be manipulated by our enemy or by your prodigal. And you're in a position to help them make good decisions by you making good decisions because you don't feel guilty I anymore. I love that. I love that. That is so freeing. Thank you so much. We could go Thank through so you. much more, but I think people are going to have to get the book, don't you? Right. That's good. And I'd love for him to do that <laughs> because I do walk them through very practical steps and how do. prodigals are going to react. It's a very practical book. It's an excellent book. Thank you so much. Thank and you. you know, if you've been watching this interview and you have a prodigal or maybe you are the prodigal, I hope that you've received some hope today. You know, we have prayer lines here. We would love to talk to you, pray with you, hear about your journey and encourage you on your journey. I myself am proof there is hope for prodigals and that where you are today doesn't mean that's where you have to end up.